Hello, welcome, Comic Book Herald's Casual Krakoa, Comic Book Herald Live. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Hey everybody, thanks for joining live. We are going to talk today about Judgment Day for Marvel. We're going to talk about a little Marvel news, a little creative team announcement on Fantastic Four. Uh, I got a Hickmania announcement doing East to West this month on our Jonathan Hickman creator own comics read-through. Got a cool one coming up this week that y'all can join live if you are so inclined. Thanks for joining. Again, let me know if there's any issues with audio and video here in the comments. Also, get in any questions or thoughts that you want to have addressed on the live stream today, and I will get to as many as I can. We had four, I believe, X-Men comics today. Um, and or Judgment Day tie-ins, Judgment Day being the major Marvel ongoing uh, event right now this summer, 2022. We had Death to the Mutants, we had X-Force number 30, we had X-Men number 13, and then we had New Mutants number 28. There's also House of X, the out-of-continuity um, play on the animated series. We can talk about a little bit as well, although I have to say I'm actually behind on the content there. Although, again, I still enjoy the premise and the creative team. We're going to talk about those comics today. There may be some spoilers that follow. Probably nothing major. I don't think anything too massive really happened today, honestly, in the world of comics. Um, but, you know, if you haven't read these, definitely walk away. Walk away. I'm also, potentially, if we have time, going to float out uh, an idea I have for a Cracking Krakow video and kind of see what you all think about um, if you're interested in that and if I should do it. I mean, I'm going to do it, but <laughs> I want to hear it from you. First, so again, hey, I'm Dave, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You can find all my work and, of course, the work of amazing writers over at ComicBookHerald.com. You can find us online pretty much anywhere at ComicBookHerald, primarily on Twitter and Instagram these days, um, and, of course, here on YouTube. If you like the live streams, if you like the videos, if you like the conversation, definitely please like and subscribe. Also, plug, plug, plug for My Marvelous Year is the Comic Book Herald podcast where we go through the history of Marvel Comics from its origins to today. We are on 1998. Okay, our episodes for 1998 are starting. Why does this matter? Well, 1998 is the start of Marvel Knights. It is the start, basically, of modern Marvel continuity. The Marvel reading order on CBH basically begins with the comics of 1998. So if you've ever thought to yourself, where should I start reading Marvel? What should I read first? That sort of conversation, that's what we're doing, right? It's a massive reading club, and if you don't have to read everything, right? It's, it's like, we'll give you the list. We'll say, hey, read these issues. These are the most essential curated picks that I've gone through and selected. Um, but, you know, then we'll talk about them on the podcast. So you can get a recap that way as well. If that sounds cool to you, you're right. It is. It's super cool, and you should come check it out. Again, the podcast is my marvelous year. Highly, highly recommend it. I'm seeing here in the chat uh, people are pouring in. That's awesome. I'm seeing here, did you see Sandman? I have not watched a lick of Sandman yet. Although, my appetite for Sandman has completely flipped. I was, like, totally checked out, just like, whatever, I don't need to see it, I don't need this Netflix Sandman. Not for specific reasons, like, let me be clear, not for the weird rage monster reasons of, of pop culture, you know, rageaholics. It was, it was just like, I've read it, and I loved it. And an adaptation doing the same thing. I don't know. It sounds kind of boring. But I've seen the response, actually, from folks saying, like, hey, this is actually really good. Um, this is better than expectations. I've seen that a lot from people I trust and from, from voices in media that I that I like. Uh, so, yeah, I want to check it out. I want to check it out. Uh, I will be watching it. I showed my wife the trailer and was like, do you want to watch this with me? Hard no. Real hard no. She gave it zero. <laughs> I don't know. if I'm putting words in her mouth. But I think it was, like, zero sand dusts out of ten. Sand dust. Zero Morpheus Gimp Masks out of 10 Morpheus Gimp Masks. <laughs> we're given to watching that one uh, with with the spouse. So uh, we're, we just started Barry. We finished season one on HBO. Um, we'll probably keep doing that. But I will, I will have to find in between workout viewings of the Predator franchise, which I had never experienced before, and possibly trying to catch up on Better Call Saul, I will have to weave in Sandman because I am very, very intrigued to see what's got people so hyped. I am, I'm fascinated by that. Um, and yes, you did hear that correct. I am watching Predator for the first time in 2022. <laughs> I know this will be upsetting to many of you, but I'm trying. I'm trying. I watched Prey first. Prey was awesome. And now I've watched the first 40 minutes of Predator. Um, that's how long I could hang on a workout these days, right? Times are tough. I got kids. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll get back to Predator uh, on the next workout, which was not today. It was not today. Today was a busy day, but I'm excited to be here talking comics and talking with all of you. Again, getting questions and thoughts, um, workout regimen, movies, shows, pop culture, and yes, of course, we can talk comics. We can probably, probably do that as well today. Let's see. I'm seeing here from Bill. Bill shares a lot of uh, a lot of good news that sometimes I miss. After reading Kieran Gillen's newest newsletter, he's writing a one-off X book before returning to Immortal X-Men. Could it be another X loser's one-shot? Hmm. It's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. What a one-off X book would be. Um, Secret X-Men was not my jam, definitely. Uh, I, I guess, oh, okay, we do have a list of, of the X losers, right? The individuals who lost the Hellfire Gala attempt to get onto the team. Uh, Firestar took their place. I'd be a little bummed if that was it, actually. I mean, I think Gillen would do a fine job with that, you know, but I, I think he's got bigger plans in motion, bigger wheels spinning, you know, than, than another Secret X-Men. Um, although, I kind of do like the the X-Men line's general approach to, like, making repetition an annual thing, right? The Hellfire Gala is a thing that will happen every year. That's a good thing. That's a good strategy, right? Just keep it in mind, right? It's like an annual issue, but with a theme, with a premise, and with ramifications for the continuity. That's actually really cool. Um, same goes for the election. So if they want to do that with Secret X-Men as well, just these series of oddball one-offs that they do every year with the, the group of X-Men who didn't make it onto the team. It's not bad. It's not bad. I could be here for that. Um, let's see. We got a question from Victor. It's going just all questions right off the bat. Are the mutants getting ready to kill that Celestial? Okay, so as we remember from last week, Judgment Day number two, spoilers follow if you haven't read it yet, okay? Judgment Day number two, Ajak and Mockery, Eternals, kidnap Mr. Sinister, and then they befriended Tony Stark, Iron Man, and all four of them together built a new celestial. They built a god. They made themselves a god because the old gods, the celestials, the OGs, were not cutting it anymore, had turned their backs on the Eternals, and let's face it, very mysterious, as gods tend to be. Um, they make a new one. The new one does what they wanted it to, which was basically call off the Eternals' war on Krakoa, the Hex's battling of Krakoa. They were like, Hex, please stop. They did that. Then the new Celestial says, y'all kind of suck. <laughs> you have 24 hours to show me why you're worthy, why I should not destroy the Earth, right? Judgment Day has arrived. You have 24 hours to justify yourselves, Okay, so that's where we are. Are the mutants getting ready to kill the Celestial? I mean, I think everyone is, right? This this Celestial is a Galactus-esque threat, but with an ethics dilemma. You know, it's, a, it's Galactus showing up and saying, I'm going to eat your world, but this Celestial is like, I'm going to give you a chance before I do that, and, and you can prove to me why humanity is worthy. You know, same premise. So yeah, I mean, all the, all the big hero types of, of Earth are going to want to stop the Celestial from doing that. I mean, I don't anticipate that anyone will genuinely be sitting here saying, maybe Captain America, right, could be the sort who could be like, well, just let him judge us. We'll be fine. <laughs> like, we'll pass the test. Like, no one's anticipating that. So, yeah, they're all going to have schemes, and they're all going to have stuff that they need to do to shut it down, um, which I guess, yes, means, means trying to kill and destroy a Celestial. So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think that is the plan, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So the, I guess I'll just start here. This was recommended by a viewer in a comment on the CBH YouTube channel, and I appreciate that. And they suggested, like, hey, can you do a video, actually, on the connections between mutants and celestials? Um, and that's in progress. That's happening. Uh, I, I spent a decent chunk of time recently looking at Apocalypse and the Celestials, you know, as one of the biggest and most obvious ties, uh, the way that Apocalypse, you know, stumbled upon celestial technology, uh, where celestial armor is powered essentially by a lot of celestial stuff at various times throughout Apocalypse's history, uh, has sort of been an agent of the celestials. I even, so I actually read today, Incredible Hulk number 455 to 457, comics from 1997, which I have deemed the worst year of Marvel Comics history. Sorry if you were born in 1997, but you were born during the worst year 
of Marvel Comics history. And those comics, they're written by Peter David because everything from 1986 to 1998 and Hulk is written by Peter David. Um, those three issues are, are when Apocalypse makes Hulk his war, one of his horsemen, uh, war. It's a very short-lived Hulk as war thing, but it's actually pretty, first off, it's real fun. Um, second off, it's pretty interesting because it's Apocalypse actually prepping for Celestial Judgment Day. The term is used. Um, he's like, I've got this Celestial Tech, but I don't trust them. I'm not, like, on their side. I anticipate they're going to come and judge the Earth. I need a plan to defend myself when that happens. And part of his plan is I'm going to make Hulk war. <laughs> right? So he's having that conversation as far back as 1997. Now, the problem that happens with Apocalypse and the Celestials, and you'll see this when I coalesce the video into one thing, is none of the creators that have sort of dealt with these themes are in conversation with, with each other, right? Like none of the creators that are dealing with the legacy of Apocalypse and the Celestials are really acknowledging what has come before beyond the pure connection of like Apocalypse Celestials and Go. Uh, if you look at the visions of the Simonsons and Fabian Di Cieza and um, uh, Peter Milligan in the 2000s, Blood of the Apocalypse, and then like probably one of my favorite runs, but the one that just goes the wildest is Rick Reminder on Uncanny X-Force. Those, those visions, the ways that they treat these things are like not in concert with each other. So that's what I'm trying to do in the video is to like, make it make sense, <laughs> right? To no prize it all together. Um, but yeah, so that's coming. I think it's going to be fun. I hope people enjoy it. I'm also going to bring in, of course, Mr. Sinister's hacking of the Dreaming Celestial, um, the time Cyclops dressed up like a penis and took on the Celestials in X-Factor. If you don't believe me, it's understandable. But, uh, and those issues are not in Marvel Limited, or at least they weren't for the longest time. Maybe they finally are now. This is the Louis Simonson era. Um, yeah, you wore a big penis hat for like six issues. And <laughs> fought celestials. We'll have pictures, don't worry. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then I, I do want to hear, and then obviously the modern connections to the Judgment Day and everything that's going on. But also, like, if you have thoughts on, like, oh, remember that time blank happened and it's related to mutants and celestials, let me know. I would love to know either here in the chat, I would love to know in the comments for this video. Uh, tweet me at Comic Book Herald because I. I mean, like, this is not a searchable thing <laughs> in, in many ways. So it's all just coming from what is stuff I've read that I can make these connections. And I basically just shared everything I can think of. Um, so, so hit me up if you have thoughts there, because I do want to include as much as possible. Okay, but Mutants and Celestials, what's the connection? That is coming. I think it'll be a fun one. Uh, and I've kind of talked about this a little bit way back in Crack and Krakoa number eight, which I actually went back and listened to. And so that was, it's the eighth video I've done on CBH. Um, it was in the wake of House of X number five, right? So this is 2019. And um, it's not bad. It's not bad. I wasn't bad at this. <laughs> I did okay. Uh, so so that video is still, is still relevant in a fair amount of ways. It has definitely some pitches and things that did happen in Ten of Swords. Uh, it also has ideas for connecting Apocalypse and the Eternals and Mutants in ways that have not happened yet, but it's Judgment Day. Judgment Day season, so they may happen yet, okay? Uh, all right, let's get into the comics today. The first one, the big one that we're going to talk about, this comes first in the reading order, basically, after Judgment Day number two, is Axe, Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals, Death to the Mutants number one. This is written by Karen Gillan. We got Guia Villanova, Di Holima, uh, rest in peace, Travis Lanham on creative credits here. So uh, this begins kind of before the conclusion of Axe number two, but it occurs throughout the issue, both Death to the Mutants and X-Men number 13, they fill in uh, some perspectives and some details on that very fast-paced uh, brouhaha that was taking place in Judgment Day number two. You know, this is the thing I talked about last week. One of the challenges of event comics is the big event issue cannot it take the space, generally speaking, to fill in all of the interesting details, right? That's what the tie-ins, in theory, are supposed to be able to do in order to make this one satisfying whole. And I would say today that Death to the Mutants and X-Men number 13 did a pretty solid job at that. Uh, Death to the Mutants is maybe the otter, definitely the otter of the two, because 
It's a book called Death to the Mutants, right? We know what that means because Druig's plan here in Judgment Day is to get the Eternals on his side on this mantra of Death to the Mutants. They are access deviation, or he has deemed them that, therefore they're going to try and kill the mutants. But this book is not a mutant book, not by a long shot. This book is an Eternals book. This is the continuation of Gillen's Eternals run that ended, you know, his partnership with Isad Ribic with issue number 12, or semi-ended. We don't really know the status of that. Obviously, that'll be determined, I think, throughout this event. But, like, this is Eternals number 13 in a lot of ways, right? Um, this is focusing on the core Eternals group, a.k.a. the characters that we know by name, the ones who would have appeared in the MCU. So you've got Icarus, you've got Cersei, you've got Makari, Ajax, Sprite, Fastos, right, the whole gang. Um, Gilgamesh shows up, all the all the faves, uh, and they're the focus. Now they, as I've mentioned a handful of times now, they have kind of turned their back on Eternal Society because they learned the secret. The secret of Eternal Society is that their immortality, their eternal nature, their resurrection protocols are based on the death of humans. Every time an Eternal dies and is resurrected, a human, a corresponding human, is killed. They are not cool with that anymore, right? So they've been unearthing kind of the secrets of Eternal's history, including, you know, as we were talking about the Celestials, like this idea that the, so they don't have this glorious purpose, that the Celestials have bestowed upon them. They are just kind of caretakers for the characters and the, the individuals that the Celestials actually care about. They are not the Eternals, even though they believe that most of their lives. Most of their lives. Okay, so this is the real continuation of Gillen's Eternals. It is not as good as that run was. Um, it is, it feels, I don't know, this is the slider. Of, of the two tie-ins, actually, I would say, although it ends with a fairly important note, I think. Most of this issue focuses on, again, the core Eternals aiding the mutants, helping the Krakoans out to stop Druig. This is what I predicted they would be doing uh, last week on Judgment Day number two, and this is what they're doing now, okay? So no major surprise right there, um, but that's what's happening. So, the core Eternals are aiding the mutants to stop Druig. Uh, at the end of one of their plans to do this, which is to uh, sabotage the Hex, the Sex, the, <laughs> the Sex, uh, I am getting, actually, if you're here in the comments, we are getting live sex chats. So Freudian slip, um, just reading a prompt of what's in front of me, all of that is happening. <laughs> um, but the Hex are these giant robotic Eternals that are massively, massively powerful. Uh, Krakoa, like all of Krakoa, including the Omega level mutants that are there, including Exodus. Exodus had to sacrifice himself just to take out one of them. Just to take out one of them, okay? So they're, the, the Eternals are working with the mutants to like actually stop the Hex, because they don't know necessarily that this uh, make-your-own-god plan is actually going to come to fruition. And at the end of that, at the end of their attempt here, Gilgamesh and Icarus leave behind a mantra for Druig and company to find, which is an inverse of the title. It is an inverse of what Druig is trying to sell in order to maintain his power, and it's death to the Eternals. This does make sense if you've been reading the Eternals run. Um, Icarus in particular, like, he's not anti-Eternal, okay? Icarus likes his people. <laughs> like, that's not the issue. The issue is he the, the resurrection protocols and the killing of humans are unacceptable to a character like Icarus and like Gilgamesh. So I think they're taking the mantra now of we need to fix our own society. We're actually the ones with the problem. We're killing innocents in order to maintain our own immortal, eternal nature. And if that sounds obvious, that would not be the case, and that has not been the case of how it would play out in eternal society, where they're like, well, we're eternal. Humans are just, they're a a speck in the span of our history, right? They don't they don't perceive these things the same way. Okay, um, so it's interesting. We got a death to the Eternals thing going on with the Eternals. How far they'll actually take that? How far they'll actually carry that out? Uh, I don't know. But it's not surprising here to see that, like, yeah, like the main Eternals that we know, they're going to be working against Ruig. They're going to be working, you know, by by transitive property with the X Men. Uh, and then the other piece of this too is Druig's taking hits. Okay, and we see this through both of these tie-in issues. Druig is falling a little bit. 
right? He had this grand plan. He was very close. He sent Uranus to planet Araco, destroyed the hell out of Mars and the mutants there. Um, and he also was like one jack of knives dart away from stopping mutant resurrection and basically winning the war. Wolverine stopped that. And now Druid kind of looks like a chump. Now he kind of looks like a chump because there's all these holes in his plan. And people are starting to notice. And he doesn't quite know what he's going to do. And that is leading Tim to turn back to Uranus, which is the clear sign of, like, he let the monster out of his cage to make a point, put him back, was in control. Now he's going back to him. And that's a problem for Druig. It's not going to end well for Druig. I loved Druig's scheming arc in the Eternals run, where he actually does outwit Thanos. It's kind of a half, you know, half-capacity Thanos, but nonetheless, like, that's a big deal. Um, here we're seeing uh, this is looking like it's going to be his fall, um, and, and Uranus certainly is not a character that any Eternal wants to be messing with, which is why he's been imprisoned for eons upon eons, okay? Uh, so that's most of what I got out of Death to the Mutants. Uh, X-Men number 13 actually plays in a very similar space. We get Icarus communicating with Jean Grey, helping her, but, you know, making her to swear to kill no Eternals. Uh, Jean Grey and Cyclops say, okay, we're going to stay on Krakoa because you saw us here in previous issues of Judgment Day, but we're going to send our newly elected X-Men team tasked with cutting the fuel lines to the Hex. Um, so you get the newly elected team in their first issue. You get Sync, Magic, Iceman, Forge, Havoc, and Firestar. They go in, and they're actually attempting to sabotage and destroy the hex um again not knowing that the uh the, the the people are building a new god okay um this issue was fun it's tight it's written by jerry duggan we got cfl on art matt miller clayton Cowles. um no notes <laughs> you know pretty again like this is this is what this x-men book and series is designed to be it is not a flagship title that is carrying through major events but the superhero team book because for the longest time we didn't actually have a classic x-men superhero team book that's what this is now if you're into things like iceman actually acting like an omega level mutant and using his powers in interesting ways that's here uh seeing sync and iceman team up and and seeing sync get bobby drake's omega level powers was pretty cool um gene taking down a hex into the ocean like there's a lot of just like good old-fashioned Superhero comics action stuff. Um, Forge, of course, building a giant gun. Havoc and Firestar are there, too. Um, Magic's probably underutilized, but she's got a big role in New Mutants going on right now, so that's that's hard to hard to complain about. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's solid, right? It's solid, and that's kind of what X-Men has been. Uh, there's nothing massively interesting. I think the stuff that, that comes out of X-Men that I'm the most hooked on tends to be what Duggan is doing with Orcus because he's one of the creators doing the most for sure with um, with Orcus right now. But, you know, otherwise he's just like, hey, what are what are the superheroes of the mutant world up to? And does a solid job at it, you know? Uh, it fits in the narrative of this event. It clearly has a role. And uh, it's, is it absolutely essential? No. I mean, I think that's one of the things about these tie-ins that is a little tricky. I feel like if you're in hook, line, and sinker with Judgment Day... It's fun to read Death to the Mutants in X-Men number 13 and see what they fill in. Uh, I do anticipate, you know, if you, once future issues of Judgment Day come out, um, you could kind of skip these in some ways. I don't know, but in some ways not. Like, it, it depends how invested you are. And, and as someone who's enjoying the event, uh, you know, they, they are additive enough and, and allow us to kind of live in this moment enough that uh, I had a good time with them. The piece of this that is absolutely not additive enough <laughs> to be counted as a Judgment Day tie-in worth your time is X-Force number 30, which is not a knock on the quality or content of, of what well, the content is, but it's not a knock on the quality of the issue so much as it's got the big old Judgment Day label on top and it's included in the solicits and the checklists for Judgment Day. X-Force number 30 has nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with Judgment Day. Big whiff, huge whiff. In some ways, it's relieving. In some ways, it's relieving. You always have tie-ins that are, like, very poorly connected to the main event. Maybe there's a page or two, maybe a little bit of dialogue, right, where they're like, okay, I guess shoehorn in some connection to this event, make it fit. X-Force number 30 doesn't do any of that. 
<laughs> and in that way it's relieving because it's more like an error than it is like a phoned in attempt to tie in. And I actually think that's better. I find it less annoying at least. Um, X-Force number 30 is doing Percy's X-Force thing. So, you know, congrats for the first completely unrelated Judgment Day tie-in. It was going to happen eventually. I think this is the best way it could have happened. You want to rip that Band-Aid off early. You don't want it to come later. Um, and, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not surprised. Like, I read the issue, and it was only after, you know, I went and started reading New Mutants that I was like, wait, did X-Force connect to Judgment Day at all? <laughs> Like, was there anything in there that actually mattered? Um, there's not. There's absolutely not. So if you're reading it thinking it's going to matter for the event, I promise you it doesn't. If you're reading it because you've been reading the Percyverse, X-Force, and Wolverine stuff all this time, then yeah, of course, you're going to keep reading. Uh, we see Wolverine get mad and chop down a Krakoa tree uh, because Quentin Quire's missing. Um, you know, Quentin Quire's, like, backups and everything. Like, there's there's no way to resurrect Quentin right now, um, which is big because he is an Omega level mutant. Uh, we see X-Force looking to play their own games as PSYOPs, change the conversation around mutant resurrection. I thought that's actually something Percy did pretty well here, is talked a little bit about, okay, mutant resurrection is out of the bag. What does that actually mean, right? And kind of what that means is that humanity is actually even angrier and actually even more turned against Krakoa kind of than it's ever been. You know, it's the reason they didn't throw it out there to begin with right? It's, it's just sounds bad. <laughs> They're like, we can resurrect mutants only. We will have immortal life. We will keep our loved ones with us, but we will not give that to you, right? That's a tough sell. Uh, also on X-Force now, we have Deadpool and Omega Red on the team, which honestly is great. It adds, adds a nice little twist, um, some new, some new tastes. You know, I, I think Percy writes in a surprisingly charming Deadpool at times, not my favorite by any measure, but like Deadpool getting chucked by Omega Red in this book, yelling Wilhelm scream, that got me. That was fun, right? There's there's a, any levity in this X-Force book is a nice change of pace, so I'm here for that. Uh, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, Craven just heard mutants are the new Apex Predator. While wearing a polar bear he had just killed. I think they are on the endangered species list, Craven, so sell down there, big guy. Um, but apparently Craven's going to come hunting for mutants, which, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> like, that sounds all right, too. So X-Force is just doing its own thing. It's chugging along the same way it's been chugging along. If you've been enjoying that, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't now. Um, if you've been checked out because it's, you know, increasingly inconsequential and takes too long to do anything, yeah, I mean, same sometimes, too. But it's always a fine read, right? All the issues are fine. I think at this point the problem is, like, you know, between X-Force and Wolverine, you know, and then X-Lives and X-Deaths, it's like a 60-issue narrative, you know? Like, it's like a 60-issue book, and, like, if you read this omnibus, you'd be like, that's cool looking, but, like, what happened? Like, we're still, like, what, like a quarter way through the story? <laughs> like, what has developed? You know, it's just, it's, slow is an understatement. Slow is an you, If you're gonna pace things deliberately and slowly and at your own pace, and this is the Hickman era of X-Men, like, we are familiar with creators who are capable of doing this, you have to have moments of payoff throughout. And I don't think X-Force has had nearly enough of those um, to to sustain and succeed at the type of story it's trying to do. I wish it did. I wish it did, because they, if you had those little moments spliced throughout this, I think you'd actually be looking at this in a pretty different lens, or I would be looking at it in a pretty different lens, saying, like, yeah, this is, this is the best ongoing Dawn of X book. Because the competition is, you know, is not, like, massively high. Right? Like, like the actual launch Dawn of X books. You know? You have X-Force, you have Excalibur, you had Marauders, um, you had X, I said X-Men, uh, New Mutants, right? So, like, what's what's the one that actually launched with Dawn of X that is, there's only, what, two of them that are still going and haven't renumbered? X-Force and New Mutants? Is that right? I think that's right. Everything else is relaunched or, or changed hands or whatever. Excalibur ended and became Knights of X. Um... So the competition is just X-Force versus New Mutants. And then you got Percy's own Wolverine is 20-plus issues at this point. Um, not a lot of the series are, like, doing long numbers things, as most Marvel books don't at this point, for good and for ill, right? Um, it could be there. It could be in the conversation. It has it has not risen to those heights. Um, but anyway, this issue is fine. It's totally fine. Uh, it just has nothing to do with Judgment Day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely nothing. Uh, it should not be advertised as such. I'm 
seeing a question here, and I don't know if it's for me, but that Uncanny X-Men 90s cards, where did you get it? Um, presumably that was the book. I'm just seeing if it's behind me. Uh, I think it's over there on the chair, but I can't I can't leave because then like, my head won't pop out. I don't know what'll happen. Uh, that's from Abrams Comics Arts. If you look up, I don't know, Jim Lee, 90s X-Men, Abrams Comics Arts, you'll probably find the book. Uh, if you ask again in the comments on the video, I can try to share the link. Um, but they were nice enough to send me a copy. It's super fun. I, I really like having that book. Uh, so I do recommend checking it out. Abrams does, they're, they're doing really cool stuff right now. I'm seeing here, I'm ready for X-Force to be given to another creator. Uh, yeah, man, just like, I just want the Percy vs. X-Force and Wolverine stuff to make a choice. Like to make a decision and to roll with it and to lean into it and really have something happen. Like we're still lingering on Beast his descent I mean how long can you watch a guy fall like like holy cow <laughs> I mean good grief Colossus as a mole is still lingering just everything everything is sitting there do something do something make a choice okay uh comic book herald your opinions on gambit please uh I don't I I enjoy his cooking in X-Men, the animated series. Um, he's an incredible basketball player, a tremendously underrated basketball player. If you've read the early post Claremont X-Men, I think it might be X-Men number four. Um, Jim Lee, his one-on-one -on -one game with Wolverine is the most impressive one-on-one -on -one game I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen LeBron James play one-on-one -on -one in high school. Okay. Gambit is better. You, I'm saying it. I'm saying it. Gambit is better, at least at trick shots. I actually don't know if they went one-on-one. -on -one. I think LeBron would body Gambit, certainly at this point in his career. Like, like here's a genuine question. Okay? And I'll spend a lot of time thinking about this, talking about this. Do you think Gambit's stronger than LeBron James? It seems like he should be. When you see the things that he does, and if you're a superhero and a super-powered individual. But, like, I don't think he's stronger than LeBron James. So I think James would just post him up left and right. I think Gambit would for sure cheat. Like, like the, even if he doesn't need to, he's for sure cheating. But the thing about Gambit is he can hit deep threes. We're talking Steph. Like, like before, when Steph was literally a toddler, Gambit was six feet behind the arc, hucking the ball through his legs, sinking shots to impress Rogue. Okay, we, we attribute the rise of the three-pointer now to Steph and the Warriors. Gambit does not get enough credit. So I don't want to be rude. I feel like Gambit is an easy punching bag for folks. Um, he's, he's a fighting Frenchman, and he's not, actually. He's not even French. He's Cajun, sorry. Um, <laughs> but he's an easy punching bag because he seems a little douchey, right? Seems like he's you know, a little too into vaping, these sorts of things. Um, but incredible basketball player. So credit where it's due. Those are my thoughts on gaming. Um, all right. Question from Jesse. Sorry to repeat this. Now that Exodus is killed in Eternal, is Icarus now an enemy of Krakoa? Uh, no. I don't think he would be. I don't think Icarus would like that that happened. But, um, Icarus told, when he was talking to Jean, he was telling her, when you send your X-Men into Eternal's territory, which he was giving her access to get to, because that's the thing about this Krakoa versus Eternal War, Krakoa doesn't know how to get to the Eternals. Like, nobody does. They live in these secret mystical cities and all these things, right? So, um, now that Exodus is killed in Eternal, I think that happens, like, like Jean, I, I guess she could have communicated to Exodus, like, oh, by the way, Icarus said, don't kill an Eternal, but I don't think that's what he meant. I think he meant anyone on the base for the X-Men's mission, um, I don't think he was talking about the war. Because, again, like, the Eternals brought the Hex to Krakoa's doorstep. There's They started a war. They can't, like, take it easy. The, they, the mutants barely are getting by as is. So, no, I, I don't think Icarus would... I don't think we're going to follow up um, on issue with that. Okay. Um, let's see. First time getting into the review live. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining, Brandon. Do you see mutants losing resurrection as a consequence... Of Judgment Day. 
Well, they haven't so far. Um, could we see... So, like, I think the Eternals definitely do. Or at least have it recalibrated or paused or something. You know, because I think that's the arc here of Gillen's Eternals, is discovering the cost of resurrection, the cost of human life. I think that information is going to get out into the public. Because right now, Druig's like, he's fighting on several fronts, but he's also trying to play a public game with humanity here, where he's like, mutants have resurrection, and they won't give it to you, and they're the enemies. But if the information gets out that the Eternals also have resurrection, and not only will they not give it to humanity, but they will kill humans to use it, <laughs> that looks way worse. That looks way worse. Um, so I see Eternals losing resurrection and maybe not becoming Eternals anymore. Uh, I don't see mutant resurrection going away in this event. Um, I think, if anything, the mutants are going to grow in number, and I think they're going to grow in number through the Deviants of Lemuria, right? Uh, don't forget about the Deviants here. If the Eternals are going to say the deviants of Marvel lore are, there's no difference between mutants and deviants. The mutants could also just be like, sure, fine, we agree. We are of a people. And that could be, that could become either an ally, a Krakoan territory. Um, Planet Arako might need some new, some new hands. Might need some new societies. Right? Maybe you get the, the deviants up there. So I think if anything, mutants are going to grow in number. Um, I don't see them losing resurrection. I also think, like, you've just put the cat out of the bag in terms of the political and societal ramifications of a Marvel Universe that knows about mutant resurrection. I think that's an interesting story. I think there's a lot you can do with that. I think that is going to continue to, to be part of the story. So, no, I, I do not think they will be losing that in this event. Um, but no no real strong Dave Stinney prediction on that front right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. What else do we got? Questions, questions, questions. All right. I think I missed... I think I missed a super chat. So give me a moment here, and I'm going to try to... Let's see. Did I grab them in the notepad? I did. I know I did. Da, 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 da. What's with all the kaiju in X Men and MCU lately? <laughs> I mean, kaiju are hot. Kaiju are super hot, um, just pop culturally, and uh, I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. You know, Godzilla had a little renaissance. Um, you had that whole Monsters Unleashed phase in 2017. Did you all know that after the the weird sort of non-event Monsters Unleashed, that there was a Monsters Unleashed mini, or not even a miniseries, like an ongoing that went for like a shocking number of issues. <laughs> like Marvel was like really into that, yet not. Um, yeah, Kaiju are just hot. They're just, they're just super hot in pop culture right now. I mean, all the, um, what is it? Uh, oh, I can't, I can't think of the word, but just whatever the actual Japanese pop culture that that stems from, that stuff's huge. You know, that stuff's huge right now. It's definitely had a cultural renaissance. I'm sure that's all it is in terms of like why it's happening in Marvel stuff in that renaissance. I mean, I think, you know, it's not the same kind of thing, but large attacking forces, a la Galactus, you know, we talk about the Celestials, like the, there's a long history of that in the Marvel Universe as well. Um, I've never mapped those inspirations in terms of Kaiju and the history of these types of things, um, but that's not surprising. Also, just like I would imagine visually... For a lot of artists, it's just like, yeah, I want to draw giant monsters. Like, that sounds like a blast, right? That seems like a cool thing to be able to give your artist, <laughs> you know? Like, hey, what do you want to draw? Um, kaiju. Okay, yep, let's do that. So I definitely think that's going to be a big part of it. Uh, let's see. We got also another Super Chat here. Dropping 15 for the Dave Stinney Cosplay Fund. Thank you. Thank you. The Cosplay Fund is growing. I saw it. Somebody sent me a link, actually, um, in the My Marvel This Year uh, Slack group. And it's for a Doctor Doom cosplay. It's a full-on Doctor Doom cosplay. It's literally my dream to just always at a moment's notice have a Doctor Doom costume um, available to myself. It is expensive as heck. It is so expensive to just get a full-on Doom costume. I thought like, oh, maybe for like a hundred bucks I could get a cape and a mask. I have found no such bargain. <laughs> I have found no such bargain. So thank you. I appreciate your Super Chat support. Does the title X-Men Red make sense to keep if Storm is possibly naming her group the Brotherhood? Do you think the X-Men First Brotherhood inevitable? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the Storm Naming Her Group, the Brotherhood thing, is already a foregone conclusion. So, yeah, I, I think the name X-Men Red will work. Uh, it, it just works better as a sales tactic, I think, too, just to be, you know, X-Men Red is a title they've had before. It's also a pretty fun play on pun uh, on the fact that they're on Mars, of course. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that name definitely has to stay. And do I think an X-Men versus Brotherhood inevitable uh, in the sense of like the forces of Araco that are these kind of diametrically opposed groups of Abigail Brand faction and the Magneto and Storm faction. Uh, Magneto, or Magneto, um, Al Ewing was definitely building to that. I think we don't understand the fallout of what Uranus has done to Araco, but I do think we will get back to that on planet Araco in X-Men Red, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, I, I do think that that conflict is definitely going to come. Those seeds have been laid by Ewing. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. All right, let's see. There must have been an X-Men shop policy to take Apocalypse off the table. If he doesn't come back in Judgment Day, how when do you see him returning? Uh, so I, I we've talked about this the past several live streams, but I definitely think this would be an ideal time for Apocalypse and the Apocalypse family to, if not come back, to make an appearance, right? To come on out of Amanth and and, you know, lay it down. Um, Planet Rocco, their people have been destroyed by Uranus. They're going to need the help. Um, you've got characters like White Sword out there, right? Some of these cooler Rocco characters. So I, I think them coming back now would be amazing. Uh, if it's not now, it is almost like, well, then when? Um, because, you know, my, my thinking when that was first teased in one of the Sinister Secrets or whatever was like, okay, they're going to save that for the end game. But at this stage, I don't have any concept of what that is anymore. Um, or, like, timing for it, you know? Like, I, they want to keep this going. They want to keep this going for a good long time. Um, so I, I kind of hope it's now. I hope it's now. I think that'll be fun. But I, I, I think it'd be fine if they were like, hey, they showed up and they helped, and then they went back to Amen. I think that'd be cool, actually. Um, so I'd be fine with it. All right, what else we got? All right, I'm going to get a quick swig. Get any questions you got. I will take a look. Uh, we haven't really talked about New Mutants yet. Let's see. That is still good, <laughs> unsurprisingly. You got Vida Ayala, Roderice, uh, Jandir Sema on art. Colors by Ruth Redmond. Letters by Travis Lanham. The big take... So this past, like, whatever it's been, four or five issues of New Mutants, has all been uh, a very Ileana Rasputin-focused story. It's about her getting back to limbo with Danny Rainstar, Wolfsbane, and Madeline Pryor. Ileana officially makes Madeline the new queen of limbo. They do a lot of fun stuff with Ileana's history, fun, but, you know, referential and, and continuity-driven stuff with Ileana's history. The book looks amazing. It's such a good-looking book. Um, a lot of, Vida Ayala is definitely, like, big in this New Mutants book on heart-to-heart, -heart, very serious and heartfelt, poignant conversations, um, character-defining kind of conversations coming from, like, Madeline Pryor and Ileana and just uh, big on feelings, big on feelings. And if you love these characters and you love understanding their paths and their histories and, and what they mean to them and how they react emotionally to those things, you should be digging this book. Um, th this book is, it's very well executed. I am excited for the book to come out of limbo, literal limbo, and back into the Krakoa sphere because I want to see it actually engaged with what's going on in this world. Um, so I'm excited for it to get out of this Ileana arc, although I think the Ileana arc has been very well executed. All right, let's see. What about Magic's new look? What about the influence of Limbo on her and the link to her powers? Um, I mean, I've probably said this before, but, like, I'm definitely the least interested in new looks and costume design and that sort of thing of maybe anyone in and around comics. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't take a lot of time thinking about it. I think it's a cool design, uh, but I am no expert. Uh, I wear a t-shirt and jeans whenever possible, basketball shorts preferably. Um, so I am not going to <laughs> comment a lot on design. Um, it looks good. I, I like, yeah, I like comics. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I Listen, I, I promise there are a number of comments 
in the chat. And if I miss yours or I'm not looking at yours specifically, I promise it's not personal or um, has anything to do with you <laughs> as a human. I'm seeing some of that in here. And, uh, and it's got, unless, unless you're 69 mega. Because 69 mega here is blowing us up with finding love. And listen, if I wasn't married, if I wasn't married, might be looking to find some love via 69 mega. Consider the opportunities, right? Consider the opportunities that are before you and strike. All right, let's see. Uh, okay, we talked about all the comics. There's one other thing. Get in your questions now. Get in your 69 mega thoughts, and I will address as much as I can. Okay, I, I saw this. Um, the question came back up about uh, Gambit. Okay. Um, I guess Gambit died. <laughs> Knights of X. <laughs> uh, listen, it's hard to take a death in the Krakow era real seriously. Um, now, if someone dies in other world, what we've been told is they can't be brought back. So could we have a permanent death of Gambit? I guess it's possible. I don't know. I guess, like, Knights of X has done some things decent, like, like solid, right? And some things really well. Right, the relationship and, and the kiss between Rachel and and um, oh geez Betsy. Right, that's a long time coming. That's a good thing to see. Uh, Gambit and Rogue in this book, I I was super down on their connection to Excalibur. I thought that was one of the biggest misses of that series. So like reading Knights of X just felt like more of like Gambit's kind of dead anyway in this book. Like he's just like it's not exciting. Okay, um, I just I don't know like that stuff. Because I wasn't, because I'm not invested in the book, I'm not invested in what happened to the particular character. Um, I anticipate we'll see Gambit again. I mean, it does. The th interesting thing that it leads to is we actually do have a build right now of Gambit is dead and seemingly can't be brought back because of the other world stuff. Although, is it is it that he can't be resurrected, or is it that? Like Gorgon and Rockslide, he'll be brought back weird. Um, because that has still been very poorly sort of dealt with. Again, with the exception of New Mutants, which actually took the time to deal with that with Rockslide a little bit, right? But, like, what is the deal with these characters right now? Um, it's, it's nebulous and it's unclear. Uh, Gambit could fit in that. But then we also have Quint Choir seemingly un, unresurrectable with what's going on in the pages of X-Force right now, if the creators are kind of building towards something like that, where all of a sudden we have characters who actually can't be resurrected, and like big players, right? People who've been on X-Men teams, Omega-level mutants, um, that does lead to some challenging questions. But then it also leads to, hey, does anybody want to pick up a copy of Trial of Magneto and check out all the stuff Wanda did? Because maybe that's a space we can play in here as well. Right? So, like, I, I do think there are some big questions and conversations to be had about, okay, can we can we take stock on resurrection again? Um, because we have some questions. Also, like, let's take stock on, for Judgment Day, you know, one of the plots here that Druig had, you know, via Moira's intel, was how to take out resurrection. Well, now that everybody knows about it, and they know that that's a threat, um, how do we protect that? What do we do differently uh, how do we make sure that the five aren't the only five mutants who can do these sorts of things? There's a decent amount of questions that, that definitely need to come out of that, and I want to see uh, what gets done there. So in that regard, I think I'm interested in what in what is going to happen. But beyond that, like I like that, that there's no emotional weight for me to that character being taken off the board in that book uh, is well said. Um, I'm seeing a question here about uh, the Hickman, the new Hickman book for Marvel. I did a whole stream on that uh, a few weeks ago after the C2E2, was it C2E2? No, San Diego announcement. Um, check that out. Check it out on the channel. It's going to be listed in, in with all the videos on the, uh, the Krakoa playlist or, you know, if you just look at all the live streams. It wasn't that long ago, and I talked about what I think that's going to be. Basically, what I said was I think it's going to be a giant cosmic book. I think it's going to be him doing stuff with, like, the, um, the, the not celestial, but the cosmic hierarchy. You know, the Eternity and the Galactus and, and uh, Infinity and all those types of characters. Uh, okay, 
Let's see. What are, what are the questions we got before we call it? I think the giant eyeball gave Magneto a heart. Don't. Didn't that giant eyeball give us all a heart? I think we really think about it. I think he did. Will Apocalypse make Amenth the new threshold? What does that mean? The new threshold. Um, I don't know what that means. Let me know. Has Sync taken the powers of an Eternal yet? That's a good question. That's an interesting question. Because we saw in the Hickman X-Men that Sync can actually take the powers of the Children of the Vault. It's not just mutants. Can he do that with the Eternals as well? I hope that comes up in X-Men number 14. It stands to reason that he should be able to, although you could make the case with the Children of the Vault that because they were in the same environment for years and years and years, that maybe that that's why they had that connection or something to that effect. Um, but that would be cool. And I kind of like the idea of Sync, who can just take anyone's powers um, straight up. You know, I think that could be could be really, really awesome. All right. I have not read X-Men number 92, or I have not read X-Men 92 yet. I have read X-Men number 92. <laughs> That's not what you're asking. I have not read X-Men 92 yet. Uh, I need to catch up on that. Let's see. We got also, okay, announcement, and then I'll talk about the last thing. The announcement, I got Hickmania number eight this month is East of West. We're reading East of West. Uh, it's such a good book by Jonathan Hickman and Nick Rigoda and Frank Martin. That is going to be live with Blurred Without Fear this Friday, okay, August 19th, and we're going to do it in the afternoon because that's when we both are available. It's going to be at 1.15 on Friday afternoon, August 19th, Hickmania, East of West, with Blurred Without Fear. Um, it's going to be real fun. I'm super excited to do it. Ernie's awesome, and uh, and this book is so good. I mean, I'm going to say this a million times probably when we talk, but it's like having done the creator-owned Hickman experience this year through Hickmania, East of West is so far and away the best thing that we have read. Um, and I don't know that it's definitely... Like, I like Manhattan Projects quite a bit. Actually, definitely the first 20 issues as well. But East of West is just a whole nother level. Just a whole nother level. If you have not read East of West and you like House of X and you like Powers of Ten, you like what's been happening in X-Men, check it out. You owe it to yourself. It's a great series. It's 45 issues, um, 10 volumes, 10 trade volumes. You could read it in a handful of days. Uh, it is great. Great comics. I think I've got it inside my top 40. I might be raising it inside the top 30. Best comics of all time. Very, very possible. Okay, so that's coming on Friday. That should be super fun. Come join us live for that. Get your questions and thoughts in while we do it. I think that'll be a blast. Final thing I want to talk about is Ryan North, Ivan Coelho, announced today as creative unit on Fantastic Four. Um, love it. Absolutely love it. So it's the end of the Dan Slot era, uh, which I was pretty out on. Uh, I, you know, I think fan casting, a lot of people are like Chip Zdarsky, Al Ewing, great fits for Fantastic Four. Probably true, uh, but I had not thought of Ryan North as a fit for this book. Now that I hear it, I can't see anything else. I'm super excited about this run. Uh, if you don't know North, um, he's a creator of a ton of, ton of interesting books, but Unbeatable Squirrel Girl is the longest run at Marvel, which was obviously a sort of a, a out-of-nowhere massive hit um, and, and a fan favorite in a tremendous amount of ways. Uh, he also has written um, the adaptation of Slaughterhouse Five, one of my favorite novels of all time, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, the adaptation, the comic adaptation, is flipping incredible. It is so good. It's I, I almost never in my life have I thought, oh yeah, I want to read a comics adaptation of a novel. Like it just that is not something I think I'm going to be super into. The adaptation of Slaughterhouse Five is amazing. It's really, really great. Highly recommended. And North's done a gazillion other things. He wrote a Power Pack mini somewhat recently that was really fun. It definitely shows. And I think highlights some of the ways that, like, yeah, he's going to be good at team stuff. He's going to be good at family stuff. Um, he's got a great sense of humor. Super nice guy. I got to interview him for the Comic Herald interview show uh, not that long ago about the Slaughterhouse Five book. So this this is going to be awesome. I'm excited about Fantastic Four again for the first time in a minute. I hope it's great. It's going to have Alex Ross covers. So yeah, I am I am really looking forward to this Fantastic Four run. I hope it gets uh, a chance. Hope it gets a chance. You know, it doesn't get six issues. Weird event tie-ins in a short run, <laughs> right? The way these things go sometimes. So, all right, we're about here at the end. Get in. Any giant questions you got? Otherwise, it's the end. Okay. What is up with Magneto coming back from such an injury? 
the hour of Magneto. It is the hour of Magneto. Magneto has a long history of inexplicably powerful magnet-based powers that uh, create force fields and all sorts of things around him. The idea that he could, like, have a hole punched through him and still be walking around, I don't even blink at that. I'm like, yeah, Magneto can do that. <laughs> I have no problems, although I'm sure it will be explained. I'm sure it will be explained. Um, let's see, I'm never like, listen, I like Superior Spider-Man. Let's, let's be clear. Let's put it on the table. I like Superior Spider-Man an awful lot, okay? Um, Slot has had good comics. I, I like some of his Spider-Man stuff a decent amount, okay? This Fantastic Four run just was not working for me. Was not working for me. I mean, I don't know. Marvel does have a bit of a problem. On one hand, it's like, it's actually nice to see a comics publisher, like, be loyal. Like, because the history of the medium and even the current, you know, actions are so not that. You know, with with most creators, like the idea of a comics creator that that a publisher is just like like yeah, we just we want to keep you employed. <laughs> like great, that's wonderful. Um, but they, I think they do have a problem right now with some creators where it's just like they it, it's like you know they have they have these pitchers and they're throwing eighty six, and they used to throw ninety five, and it's like well, you've got too many of those on the roster right now, and you can only be respectful so far <laughs> before you're just getting jacked out of the park every time. You know, and I think that's happening to Marvel here and there, here and there, um, but not all over the place. And if you know, you know, right? If you know, you know. Uh, all right. Any final thoughts? Okay. Okay. I hope it, I, I mean, the last time we had a really good Fantastic Four was, I mean, the easy answer is Hickman's, Right. I think it's actually Marvel Now, the FF series that Matt Fraction and Mike Allred did together. I think that was colored by Laura Allred. Uh, I like that FF book a lot. Calling that a Fantastic Four series is like a real stretch. <laughs> it is and it isn't. Um, but that FF book was good. Oh, the Zdarsky Marvel 2-in-1. Um, the Chip Zdarsky and Jim Chung Marvel 2-in-1. That's like 2016-ish. That's probably the last good Fantastic Four story. And that's a Ben and Johnny story. It's well read and sewer in the multiverse post Secret Wars, um, but that's a Fantastic Four story through and through. It's also a good Doom story. So there's been some stuff. There's been some stuff here and there, uh, but uh, but yeah, like a proper Fantastic Four run. Yeah, let's let's see it happen. So all right, that's gonna do it. We're gonna go get some dinner. Thank you, everyone, for joining live. Much appreciated. Oh, I just realized I never showed the images today. Just me. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see you next week. Enjoy the comics.